just do. So I just making sure I don't use presenter. Hi. Nearly ready. Sorry. So when you are ready, tell me that we can uh, start, and I will introduce you. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Let's. Yeah. And then, do ready? I need them? Um, and just just shout. That's fine. Right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. So hello. Welcome in the next workshop, which is uh, C Sharp on Linux. Uh, it, is a, will be, it will be led by Martin Woodward, who is uh, the executive director of the Network Net, .NET Foundation. There you go. Just some organizational comments. Please be quiet if you go out or inside. Uh, don't disturb others by the door. Nothing, so thank you. Thank you. Please, Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, as I say, my name is uh, Martin Woodward. If you want to um, abuse me on Twitter in real time, I've switched Twitter notifications off, so you won't all see them, which is good. But it's just at Martin Woodward. Uh, please tell me if I'm speaking too fast or get overexcited. It is, it's, how I, it's how I work, unfortunately. Um, so... Just, uh, just to set expectations early, we've got a fantastically full room, which is awesome to see. Thank you very much for your time. To make sure I don't waste your time, I want you to get the next 90 minutes and learn something. And if it's not from me, then I don't mind. I just want you to learn something in the next 90 minutes. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use the very, very, very very latest build of a thing called .NET Core, which is a new version of uh, .NET that's being developed in the open source community, um, and Microsoft are involved. Um, and we're going to learn C Sharp, the language, using this brand new version of .NET. That isn't ready yet, okay? <laughs> So uh, I was up quite late last night. Uh, who's planning on following along on Fedora 2.3, for example? Yeah, we might have some trouble. So when you're following along, you might want to use uh, mono rather than, um, and I'll show you where to, you know, if you have got mono installed already, I'll show you how to install that. But rather than installing the very latest version of .NET that I have, that I'm going to show you here, um, don't, because I tried it. I was trying it all last night and found some problems. So stick with mono, and you'll be able to and you'll be able to follow along. Okay. Um, and then I'm the plan. We'll see how it goes. The plan is um, I built a workshop over the past week, a tutorial style, and put it up on my GitHub repository. So if you go to tinyurl dev conf c sharp and I'll put this up on the board so we have it for later in case you want it later on. So tiny u r l dot com. Wow, I can't even write this one. There we go. U r l and then it's uh, dev conf uh, c sharp. Okay. And um, that has the full tutorial on it with lots of words so you can follow along, um, especially if you're having trouble, say, keeping up with my very fast English. Um, and feel free, at this point, that has everything you need, so feel free to just walk out and grab the next session if you wanted to, because you'll be able to follow along virtually here if you need. Okay? So that's, the, that's everything we need today is in that GitHub repository. We're going to go through and we're just going to do the very basic what is .NET. Uh, we're going to just do some simple, you know, hello world stuff. And I, I'm assuming, well, let's, let's have, who here has done any C-sharp programming before? Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, who's done things like... 
who knows about lambda expressions and link? Okay, it's very advanced for you guys then. So uh, you, might, you might just want to wander on, or you might want to have a play with .NET Core and see how, uh, how bad it is and, uh, and, 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 and have fun with it that way rather than using mono. And then, um, yeah, so the idea is it's, it, who here has um, never used C Sharp before? Okay, that's who, the, that's who we're aiming at. Um, but of those people, who's used, say, Java? So raise Java hands. And then uh, Go, uh, Python, okay. uh, Swift. Okay, so we'll be fine. It's a, it's, a, it's a modern language, so we'll be fine as we go through. And then, so yeah, we're basically going to just run through and do a crash course in C Sharp is the plan. So uh, as I say, feel free, I will, if you want to, we'll see how it's going, but just look at the repository and just head off. Um, it also includes instructions on how to get uh, the, the very latest build of .NET on your, on your machine. So. Okay, as I say, my name is Martin, uh, Martin Woodward. Uh, if you want to email me, you can. Abuse me on Twitter. That's what I look like, in case you forget. I don't know why that's there. There we go. Um, and I work at a company called uh, the .NET Foundation. We're an, a non-profit foundation uh, that's set up for um, open source .NET. I'll talk more about that in a moment. I live in, uh, not far away, in rural uh, Northern Ireland, um, which is a beautiful part of the world. There's the view from my, my desk. Uh, it's uh, great. It always rains in Northern Ireland, so uh, we have lots of good rainbows. Um, and then uh, it's... Um, I do... So I, I work for the .NET Foundation, and I'm, I'm Microsoft pay my wages to go work on the .NET Foundation. Um, so Microsoft give me a desk as well in the office in Belfast. So, I don't know. Has anyone been to Belfast here? Couple, no? Okay. Uh, that's where my office is in Belfast. Uh, it's just the... Uh, you see that little... Uh, the, oops, sorry. Let, get me laser pointer on. Wait there. Uh, bu bu uh, pen. Here we go. Sorry about that. Uh, it's just, uh, just up here. Uh, up in, oh, I've done it wrong again. There you go. Just there is where I where the desk is. That's an old battleship. I tell you what. Um, has anyone uh, seen Game of Thrones? You, what Game of Thrones? Yeah, that's where Game of Thrones is filmed. Yeah, yeah. I know. It looks so glamorous. <laughs> it really isn't. And then that's uh, a good. If anyone, when you do come to Belfast, I'll be. I do my tourist information. Um, come here, that's a great museum, the, the Titanic Museum. And actually, don't let this worry you, um, but uh, you know, the entire open source strategy of .NET comes out of this little office here, and that hole in the ground, that's where the Titanic was built. So uh, hopefully this one will end better, you know? As we like to say, it worked when we last touched it, is what we hear, so uh, yeah. Or... Um, Built by an Irishman, driven by an Englishman, is the other, is the other thing. Okay, I, most of the team, uh, a lot of the uh, .NET committers, uh, work over in Redmond, in the Microsoft office there. And as I say, I work for the .NET Foundation, which is uh, it's a non-profit foundation set up to um, help .NET have a, uh, a healthy and vibrant ecosystem and make sure that the core of .NET doesn't belong to any one company, you know, and make sure that people can uh, invest in it. Because, I don't know, for some reason, people still have a little, you know, ha have a hard time believing Microsoft getting into open source. It still kind of, you know, uh, rings... Oops, sorry, I'm jumping around. It still makes people confused. Now, we're not open sourcing everything. Most of you are too young to even know what this is. This is Microsoft Bob. So uh, we're not going to open source everything. There are limits to where Microsoft will open source things. But um, we're definitely doing a lot more open source. 
In the .NET world, uh, in the .NET Foundation, we, we have right now 180 projects, and uh, you know there are about um, 4,000 people have have had a PR merged into the the into .NET, the the version that we're going to play with today. So it's uh, um, of those, I think about 200 people are Microsoft employees, and then the rest is the world. So. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a pretty active community and fun. Now, um, of those 4,000 people, uh, a lot of them are doing this for fun. And so obviously the people who get paid to do it every day tend to be, at the minute, getting more PRs merged because they get paid to work on it all day long. So uh, at the minute, I'm finding it's about 80% of the PRs being merged are for people with Microsoft in the company name, and then 20% is other. I would like to see some bigger chunks uh, rather than just one other block, but we'll get there. And then um, people are coming back and submitting multiple PRs, which is great as well. It's not just people, you know, fixing a spelling mistake in a comment and running away, it's, uh, as you've all probably had. It's, uh, it's people actually sticking around. And in fact, we, when we open source um, .NET originally, we open sourced it, and then four days later, a guy called Jeff Norton, who's one of the mo mono um, committers, he uh, he he delivered um, the the Mac port of it <laughs> in four days, and like we had a team of people in Microsoft, you know, who'd been looking about for ages, and uh, you know, for, we believe in um, uh, again, Microsoft's kind of getting starting to understand open source. It's, taken, it's, it's took a while, but we're getting there. And um, the, 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 the thing with this .NET effort, open sourcing .NET, is we decided rather than to work away on it in secret and then go, ta-da, and hand it over the wall with an open source license, uh, we decided... Bravely, some say foolhardly, uh, foolishly, but we are bravely, I think, to um, begin in the open and to be 100% in the open and have the developers working on this project that we announced we are doing in the open on GitHub. So if you want to see all, their, all the pull requests, there is no secret repo anywhere. They all work um, in GitHub, um, and that's where everybody works every day. So it's great. And then if we track the number of contributors we get in, it's doing quite well. Um, we're, we're still, we've sort of dropped below Node in terms of the amount of people committing to our repository since the beginning of Node compared with .NET, but we're, 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 we're up there. We're doing, we're doing okay. We're definitely better than uh, previous efforts from Microsoft in terms of getting people involved and making sure it's not just, it's not just being published under an open source license. It's actually an open source healthy project. And I'd say just a quick word about Microsoft, the, the elephant in the room, as it were. Uh, the attitudes have changed a little bit inside the company late, recently. Um, partially um, because the, 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 the kids are in charge now. You know, we've all, adult supervision has left the room. And uh, the next generation of people are definitely leading the charge in the company. And people like um, Satya, who used to, you know... He used to be closer to me in the org chart than he is now. He, he's risen a long way and I've stayed where I am. Um, and then Scott Guthrie, and you know, this, led by senior executives in Microsoft, is definitely a change. Um, and it's been great to see the change in culture. In my old job in Microsoft, I was the one that uh, created our GitHub repository one day. Um, and I moved us on to GitHub um, for a lot of our open source work. And that was in, believe it or not, um, June last year was when Microsoft started using GitHub officially, um, and as, a, as Microsoft. And then uh, there are now 2,000, this morning, I took the screenshot this morning, 2,724 full-time engineers in Microsoft working in GitHub. That's well. So that's a lot of people contributing to the open source world, which is just great to see. 
And for me, I come from sort of the Eclipse background and the Java background um, and the Linux background. And coming into Microsoft, it's been a great time for me because the companies come closer to the way I used to work anyway, rather than having to adjust to those people. What I've liked the most is the culture change in the company. Microsoft's a very, um, uh, again, it's a very email-driven company. Uh, so lots and lots and lots of email. If I show you my email inbox, I think there's 23,000 unread messages in my inbox right now. It's, uh, it's important, they'll phone me. But um, it's... Um, so, the, of the, of, it's a very email-driven company. But one of the great things, um, you know, when somebody has a, again, you're all too young, but uh, when somebody has a baby in the office, they quite often send around pictures of, you know, hey, we've had a baby, great, woohoo. And the, the best thing I enjoyed, and I knew I'd won, I knew we were winning in the company, was somebody sent out um, an email saying, hey, here's the baby. And the, res the first response that came back was, you know, plus one, looks good to merge. So uh, I was like, yes, we're winning. <laughs> Culture's changing. Right, quickly, um, most of you know then, it seems, that .NET is, you know, just a, it's a general purpose uh, platform. Um, it's always been multi-language, so, you know, lots of different languages on, the, on what's called the, the core language runtime. But... Um, it's VB, C Sharp, and F Sharp are the primary languages today in .NET, the ones that have the most innovation. Um, and it's always been multi-language, but now it's becoming multi-language and multi-platform. Yes? You don't consider Prolog.NET um, an important language? Uh, <laughs> I, I consider everybody's languages important. Uh, and uh, I, I love Hask Haskell as well. But... Um, it's more the, 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 where, the, uh, where the funding's going in terms of full-time developers working on it. So, yeah, apologies if I offended any pro-net people. But there's things like Iron Python as well, and there's, there's lots of other languages on top of a CLR. And there's quite a few experimental languages as well. And somebody, um, the CLR, lots of people in Microsoft Research use the CLR as a, um, a playground to try out new languages and new computer science. It's quite... Quite interesting if you're into that sort of thing. But anyway, um, there are two specs that define uh, the CLR. There's uh, 335, which is the runtime, and then uh, 3344, which is C sharp. That spec is woefully out of date with the modern C sharp. So one of the things I'm doing right now is working with the team to update it, and we're hoping to update it to. Uh, the C sharp version five language, and then quickly get then onto C sharp six in the spec. But it, it is it is a public uh, spec. And currently, the, the version of the C sharp covered by three three four four is C sharp two, which is right. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So hey, I've I've only been in the job since April. I, I should say, <laughs> but uh, I think I'm we'll. Pro yeah, 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 no, no. I, it, yeah, it's one of those things where. Again, as they're learning to be more open, uh, they, they realise they're keeping it up to date. Um, the, in June, I'm hoping, is when they're going to get this solidified and get catch up a bit. And it's important that all of .NET is available. Uh, if you go to that org on GitHub, it's all there. The compilers, the framework, the runtime, the JIT, the uh, GC, it's all there. So... And it's all under, um, there's a mix of MIT license code and uh, Apache license code as well. So it's all permissively licensed. So go crazy. If you want to go do a fork of .NET that does something else, go for it. I'd rather you didn't. I'd rather you contributed back. But you know what I mean. It's all there if you want to. Um, the F Sharp compiler, the C Sharp compiler and the VB compiler is a project called Roslyn. If you uh, want to find the compiler, if you're interested. F sharp has its own compiler because it turns out um, in F sharp's a functional language on .NET, and it turns out writing compilers in functional languages is is a really interesting and fun problem. So one of the first things the F sharp guys did was was bootstrap their compiler in F sharp. Um, so uh, so yeah, the, the the F sharp compiler isn't Roslyn. Um, it's because uh, Roslyn's written in C sharp. So the VB compilers are in C-sharp, which, boo, never mind, sorry, VB guys. 
Um, and then the entire web stack as well is open source, including the new high-performance uh, web um, engine, Kestrel. <coughs> Talk a bit about C-sharp language. Uh, obviously, uh, there was V1, V2, where the ECMA spec is. Uh, C-sharp 2 was, where, was when generics were introduced properly. Um, and I say properly as well, you know, actually introduced properly in, in, the, in the bytecode. Um, and then we've had a bunch of new features come in since then, uh, which we're going to cover today. In C Sharp 6, there were some new features again, which I'll show you. But the main, uh, the main driver for within the C Sharp 6 timeframe was actually rewriting. The compiler used to be written as a, a big lob of, uh, of C++. I think it was like a 30,000 line file. It was the compiler in the old days. And uh, so they rewrote the compiler in C Sharp for uh, at the C Sharp 6 time frame and open sourced it. And then uh, the future for C Sharp 7, which is the next version of a language, is, is around very um, lots of things around streaming, lots of things around uh, small kernel performance and things like that. It's where they're heading and making sure it's fast and uh, lightweight and doing things like. Um, Messing with uh, you know uh, high performance strings and just when you're trying to do lots of high performance web servers like string manipulation is really important. So anyway, uh, go ahead. Question about the Rosling compiler. Yeah. Uh, is it supposed to compile to the full feature .NET framework or is it supposed to? Yes. Good. To great question. Core yeah. Is the Rosling compiler just a .NET Core or is it for the full framework? It's, that's a brilliant question because it's the it is the same compiler for the full framework. So, um, and we'll, we're going to cover that. There's different versions, like different flavors of .NET. And there's the, there's the traditional .NET that you know and love, some of you, that you know, sits on big Windows machines and you install it into your GAC and all that sort of stuff. And it ships with Windows and it ships with Visual Studio. That thing uses the Rosling compiler underneath as well as .NET Core. Uh, and parts of the Rosling compiler, uh, now the licensed under a proper open source license where people don't have to worry about patents and things and you know it's actually really open uh, then the mono guys as well are also um, you know using it and, and it's starting to try and make the whole uh, ecosystem a lot richer which is great fantastic question thank you um, I'll, I will bring up a I'll, I'll send you a link to a post so you can Probably because it's um, right now the, there's, there's actually a set of GitHub issues where they're defining C sharp seven and what they want to go build in it. So I, um, I will I will uh, put up a link to that before we finish today, and then you can go read in the detail and then tell them where they're going wrong as well. But but briefly, it's to when I say microservices, I'm more features to the language to help it be more efficient for making small services like um, good handling of, of streams, you know, very high performance stream I.O., high performance um, handling of uh, UTF-8 strings and optimized handling of UTF-8 strings. Because in .NET, .NET does U uh, strings are UTF-16, which is great, and we do localization, you know, globalization really, really well. But if you're running in a small uh, microkernel, a small kernel, um, you're throwing away half your bytes all of a sudden because you know you've got all these extra characters you're never using on the web because you're probably only using UTF-8, so that sort of thing. Uh, and then um, I'm trying to do that while keeping current strings is hard work, by the way. But anyway, and then uh, in terms of C sharp, it's one of my goals again when I started was to get uh, C sharp as a one of the top trending languages on GitHub um, and in Stack Overflow. And we've got there now. We're in the, you know, we're in the top sort of five, if you combine GitHub and Stack Overflow, which is good. Top ten. So langpop.nl is an awesome site if you want to go do any research on uh, GitHub data and, uh, and, and, um, and languages and things. Just quickly, and then we'll get coding. Uh, .NET's always been split into verticals. And you've always had like a big single version of a framework installed on your Windows machine 
and on the desktop. And then when you wanted to upgrade .NET, it was always a real pain because you upgraded it for every single application on that one machine, and then it would you know break half of them. There was no way of saying I want five you know I I, I want five versions of .NET and I don't want any of them to touch. It usually it usually broke well not break things, but it usually made them run under a different version of a framework, which you know sometimes breaks things. And then we have all the things like uh, you know the Windows Phone, and we had. Um, the ASP, which runs under IIS on Windows, and again, a big lump of framework, and you would install that on the box and bring things in. So it's, all, it's organized into verticals. We also had things like compact framework and uh, micro framework and the version, uh, you know, and lots of different versions of .NET, but always a vertical, often developed with the same API, but completely in isolation. With .NET Core, what we're trying to do is... Uh, make it a lot more modular and a lot more componentized and then um, make it so that um, the things we build on top of .NET are inheriting from a common core and that core be open, fully open source so that if somebody like the Xamarin guys want to you know, take .NET and port and make it work on iOS and Android then they can do that with a full, um, high-performance, open-source base that's the same base that Microsoft are also funding to develop things on Azure and all that sort of stuff. So it just makes sense. And it's all split down into lots of modules, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there are different versions of .NET right now, which you should consider. Um, there's a .NET framework, the big desktop framework for building WinForms applications and stuff. Uh, that, that's still there, that's still being developed, that's very, very active development still, and will remain so, because it borrows, it uses components from, from stuff we're also building for .NET Core, like the compiler and everything, and the base class libraries and so on. Then you have Mono, which was originally developed as a... Um, uh, any Mono committers here, by the way? Because they probably know about more about it than me. Okay. Uh, you know, it developed as a parallel... Um, uh, fork of .NET and had to be done very carefully because of the, the times. You know, things weren't shared as openly as they are nowadays. So, um, and they did an amazing job. Um, and Mono is very equivalent to the full desktop framework, but whereas the desktop framework runs on Windows, Mono runs everywhere, even on my little Raspberry Pi. It's awesome. Um, the, but it's very much the, the traditional .NET framework approach. Then you have the Xamarin stuff, which is based on top of Mono, which gives, takes Mono to iOS and Android. And then uh, finally we have .NET Core. And .NET Core is being used for AS, the new version of ASP.NET, ASP.NET Core. And also it's used in... Um, anyone heard of Universal Windows applications or Universal Windows? Oh, awesome. Okay, cool. Well, the marketing guys have done the trick there. So, uh, basically, UWP apps or Metro apps is probably what people think of them. But, you know, the Windows 10 applications, uh, that that's runs on top of um, UWP, the Universal Windows platform, which is based on top of .NET Core. Um, again, it's a much more modular version of .NET. And what that also uses, makes use of a feature is the ability to compile .NET code uh, into native code now. So uh, you can actually... Yes, sir? Uh, one question. I thought that .NET Core is still not in production version. Or is it? Um, there is a... Uh, the, the libraries that support UWP are based on top of a, a point-in-time snapshot of that code base. Uh, but it's not. It's a, it's slightly different stuff on the front end. I'll dig into it more and show you more later if you want. We can do it privately, but yeah. But uh, so there are parts of it. But no, .NET Core itself isn't in production. But there are parts that have gone into uh, production applications. I think. And then, so all that, as you say, shipped uh, in the last version of .NET. And then we're working on um, all of the .NET Core stuff, and in the open. And then I've warned you already. But uh, here be dragons, you know, it's, uh, we are on the bleeding edge, as we'll, as we'll see. So we, we do some hackery today. And then finally, one of the things the team are focusing very strongly on is on performance. So uh, this is using, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the I've forgotten the name of the benchmark now, sorry. If you click on, when you get the deck, if you can click on the link, you'll see where all the benchmark data is. But what they're trying to do is drive the performance up of... Um, 
of .NET, so it's really, really good at handling high web loads, for example. So if you look at ASP.NET 4.6, then it can handle, you know, th that sort of 32-thread system could handle 60,000 uh, requests per second. And they're up to 1.8 million, and they're trying to get to towards 3 million you know, requests per second. So they're really trying to get it very, very, very high performance. Right then, let's go. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, tinyurl.com, WAC, DevConf shop. Is anyone able to get there on the Wi-Fi? Or uh, if you want to follow along. If not, then uh, I hope so, because I'm going to be using it as well. And then uh, let's just wake up my VMs. Have you lost typo somewhere? Because I can't Okay, let me just check. So it's uh, D E V C O N F C sharp. Let me try. If you want, if you just go to. Um, let's have a look. Tiny URL. Uh, there you go. That's that's what it is. There is that, yeah. Okay. Or you can just go to get if you just search for Martin Woodward GitHub, and then you get to my repository. Um, I have already put down where. Oh, brilliant! I'll merge it. <laughs> what did I do wrong? Uh, you are using sudo too much. Okay, good man. Thank you very much. So that, that, that is a, that's a habit from Microsoft people. Always, we always like to run as admin, you know. You know us. Brilliant. Thank you very much. That's awesome. And please do that. If we find some problems today, please do. Uh, we'll, we'll fix it as we go through. Because, um, uh, okay. And just, let me just, uh, yeah, get rid of that. Um, so you don't need to pull down the repo. Oh, I want to show you a couple of other little things as well while we're here that you might not have seen. So uh, let me just make this a bit bigger for you. Um, ba -ba -ba. Uh, there we go. I believe control plus force. Oh, sorry. There we go. I was gonna. There we go. Thank you. I'm learning already today. Oh, look at that. That's better, isn't it? Yeah, do we like it? Okay. So one of the things I wanted to show you was, um, I said Microsoft changing a little bit. Um, so let's do, for example, uh, Microsoft have a, um, a, uh, a new editor they've built. So let's just do code readme.md. So this is uh, an editor, it's called Code, Visual Studio Code. Uh, you know, everything's got to be Visual Studio when it comes to developer tools, it's part of the law. Um, so, but it's an it's a Atom-based, uh, Electron-based, uh, um, lightweight editor. You know, I, I um, put it this way, I was sceptical. Um, the guy that, that runs the team is a guy called Eric Gamma. You've probably read, you know, your books of Gang of Four books. And uh, he's also one of the guys that originally, you know, sort of got clips off and running off the ground. So I was like, oh, wow, okay. And then uh, when I first started seeing it, it was actually pretty awesome. And it's, it's turned me from Vim onto, onto, onto code. So that's, that's saying, that's high praise. But I was always a more of a Vi user of Vim rather than a real Vim guy. There's people who use Vim like it's Emacs, and that's just, they're just crazy. So uh, I, I'm not that clever. Anyway. So, um, but yeah, so this is Visual Studio Code, and it's got some neat stuff in it as well. Like, um, I can do side-by-side -side view. So here's my Markdown file, and then, uh, you know, it can render the Markdown side-by-side -side with it, which is quite neat. So speaking of Markdown, if you're wanting to have .NET Core and, uh, or, uh, tell you what, shall I merge your PR in so that they, their instructions have less sudos, and then uh, I might do that. But if you want to get .NET Core up and running, um, if you're running it on, let's say, it will just work on Fedora. The, uh, now, it won't be Yum, I forget, sorry, I spend most of my time around. It's not Yum. What is it? Yum is Fedora. Okay, there we go. So, it, it, but I thought on, I thought no, Fedora was... No, it's not anymore. Sorry, I found that out. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's that, what is it? Yeah. Thank you. It's Dan the Five Yum. 
uh, it's that one. So that, well, you can just type yum and it, and it, it aliases over to the right thing anyway. So eventually, it's going to be yum space dot net and magic happens, but we're not there yet. Uh, so this is the, this is the ugly version. Uh, is what we've got instructions for. Um, so you, you have to install some prerequisites. I then went and did all this tutorial on a known... This is because things have been a bit flaky. So rather than have you download the latest build, which may or may not work, I ran all this on that particular build. So I know that works. So uh, I wanted to make sure... The latest build might well work for you, fine. But I just wanted to make sure if you were following along today, you were using a build which I knew worked and I'd, I'd tested all this stuff on. So uh, there we go. And then, uh, you know, uh, extract it and then put it in your path, basically. <clears throat> or uh, if you're running on Debian-based things and, uh, you know, whatever. Um, and we've got, we've got on Debian, we've got to the point where you can do app get install. And that, that's the experience we want to have for, uh, in, in your, obviously, we'll get there. <clears throat> especially with your guys' help. Right. So then what we're going to go do, because that's tutorial one, is just getting all this stuff on your, installed on your machine. So um, I'm going to assume you can get that done, but it will, uh, we'll go and have a look, and we'll see if we get some problems. Sorry, I'm going to follow along with this. Um, let me do it here. So getting started. There we go. Da, 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 da. Right. So the first thing we're going to do is, and as I say, if you've done C Sharp before, then this is maybe a little bit basic, but uh, I'll show you what the experience is like under .NET Core. So, um, uh, so. right. Um, okay, so. When you install .NET Core, you get the .NET command, .NET, and you type .NET. It's quite annoying. Uh, that was the world, that was back before we had the memo about the internet. Was when .NET was named, and so we have the world's worst name when it comes to Google foo. But never mind. So yeah, see, I know. What were we thinking? Anyway, I think they even, uh, Google even modified their search engine to to provide for C sharp so that it's not. It's like, it's different from C. Yeah, there's um, one of the main, uh, funny, one of the, uh, one of the best C-sharp programmers on the planet and uh, who, who's own, he's won Stack Overflow, a guy called John Skeet. You know, he obviously works at Google, which is hilarious because, you know, he's, he's not there. But he's, anyway, he's a good guy and he, he's working on .NET stuff now at Google, so that's awesome. <coughs> yeah, so um, once you've got it installed, you can do .NET version and boom, you're up and running. And then, um, or if you want to follow along with Mono, then, then uh, you can. Um, yeah, so all you do is, so I'm in, a, I'm in here, I just do, I can do .NET space new, and it sets up a scaffold of a quick um, Hello World project for me. So you've got, you know, program CS, where all the work is, and then... Uh, a couple of files. You can ignore the nuget.config for now. Nuget is the .NET package manager, you know, like Maven or, or Yum or whatever. So it's, it's the packet manager for .NET. And then, or NPM as well, it's quite close. Project.json is a thing that describes the project. So, um, and basically, it's telling us that, uh, that again, because I've specify the build that we're running on here, making sure we're going to be fairly stable. It's specifying an exact version of the .NET standard library that we want to use. And then as we pull in other things later on, like uh, threading or whatever, then we would add new dependencies into that dependency thing there. This framework section is the frameworks that you want to build on. If you were running this uh, on Windows with the full framework, and you wanted to build a library that supported the full framework, .NET Core, maybe uh, you wanted a portable class library that worked on Windows Phone 8 and stuff like that, then you can, you can actually specify multiple framework versions as well so that when you do a build, it builds them all. Um, but we're just going to do .NET Core 5. And then if we, uh, I'm going to try and make myself use code. If I jump, if I had to type vi and then an app kick me, because I'm, uh, I'm trying to force myself to use code, because it's actually really good. 
Um, so, code dot. There we go. But I'll show you why I like it. You can configure, so uh, we, there's a project called OmniSharp, O-M-N-I Sharp, um, and that gives um, completion, language completion, so lots of different things. It's a language completion service, and there is a plugin into Vim for OmniSharp, so you can get all your you know, auto-completion of C-sharp stuff within Vim if you want to. I'm going to do it inside of this fancy code editor because it's pretty. But uh, let's see how we get on. I need to make the font bigger here too. I wonder if they've done Control Plus. Probably not. Um, no, there we go. Never mind. I think, I think to make my... Uh, it's a proper editor. So I think to do my preferences, I actually think I need to go in and... Um, you have the Control Equals, I think. In the view menu. He's better than me. Look at that. And minus works. It, it was actually in the view. Oh, was it? Oh, well, there we go. Thank you. Yeah. So there we go. See? Woohoo. Right, we can read it. Brilliant. So, um, and it does Hello World. I mean, when you do .NET New, it spits you up a Hello World, which is cool. We should probably do something a bit more funny than that. The next thing that you do normally is you type .NET Restore. What .NET Restore does, don't do that if you're on Rail or whatever. But uh, we, uh, you read the instructions there in tutorial two if you're on rail. Normally you would type that, and that's what you will be able to type, and it will magically work in about a week or two. It might even work today, but I didn't want to risk it. So um, unfortunately, uh, it didn't recognise rail and uh, Fedora two three properly, and the guys were building it like we're living in CentOS world, and so it kind of wasn't working great. And so what we have to do um, is a bit of a, a hack, uh, which I've documented here, where basically, um, sorry, I'm just going to make that bigger. Uh, basically, you pretend that you're cen cen CentOS or CentOS, how do you pronounce it? Both, okay. CentOS, I like that. It makes me sound cool. So uh, I normally say CentOS in my head, so I'm going to go with CentOS. Um, so you just pretend you're CentOS, and then uh, what you have to do is um, hack a file to flip it from saying I'm CentOS to actually being on rail or whatever you're on. So, um, so and there's my my crazy use of said, which again you could probably do a pull request and fix my said, but probably wrong as well. And then what I do is rather than doing that every time, I just set up an alias of DNR which do, runs both commands. So I can just type DNR and it'll do that quickly for me. Rather than, and, and what I'll probably do is actually map DNR to, you know, to, to do .NET Restore for me again later because it's an amusing, amusing acronym. So I'm going to do dot .DNR here, but if I was over in the Mac and did it properly, then uh, make the Hello World, CD Hello World, um, .NET new. So that's the experience we want to get to. And we might already be there. There we go. Oh, hello. That, that doesn't sound great. Well, that's kind of the experience we want to get to. Okay. So once you've done uh, restore, it knows about the packages. Oh, yeah. I've definitely done something wrong in my set, but never mind. And then we've got the, um, we've got the project. We've got a file called a project.lock.json, which basically tells the, the compiler where to get the packages from. And then we've got the program. And then to, to build it, we could do .NET build. Again, we could also do .NET build hyphen hyphen native, and that would actually give us an executable, you know, a, a single uh, thing with a Gmod A, you know, U plus X on the bit, XU bit, jolly. Um, again, native build's not working this week. So, hey, let's not do that today. <laughs> Let's go with the very slow, but always works, .NET run. And what this does is it, it um, does the .NET build in memory and then executes it and then throws the thing, and then ridiculously throws the thing away that it just built. And it's like, well, why do you keep it around first? Uh, well, that, uh, that is, uh, hey, look at that, brilliant. <laughs> and then, you know, you can, hello, Bruno, there you go. And again, oops, sorry. And then, uh, done it, run. And this is the, um, again, this, is, this will get faster. 
Well, this is the uh, this is the experience of editing.net. You know, you edit the files, hit run, or hit build, and then it goes and does the stuff. There is a REPL. Uh, uh, um, if you want to do interactive.net, you can just do .net REPL, and you know, uh, he says, "Well, that worked." And then you know, type .net in uh, system. I think this works. Dot. Uh, and yeah, so you can type .net in and then it does stuff and it executes it badly but uh, apparently I've done something wrong but anyway I'll type it properly next time I'm sorry quit no. pound quit is it something so, I'm just going to call C that'll work ok uh, right so yeah there we go Woohoo! Hello world, brilliant. My work here is done, let's go home. Right, next one. Um, so, da 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 da. Yeah, it's just go for Actually, yeah, that's a good point. So, uh, it's a C like language, I suppose. It, you know, it's kind of, if you've seen Java, you'll get it, I guess, as well. It's, you know, it's uh, the. .NET has, at the top, rather than like import, like they have in basically every other language in the world, it uses using to, to bring in dependencies. So um, using, and using system means I'm, at the minute, just pulling from the system library. Things like console and thread and stuff are in there. But all the collections are all in different namespaces, or what they call packages in the C-sharp world. So um, I'm defining this class called program to live in a namespace called console application. And then you have a, a public static uh, void main. That's what the executor looks for within a .NET assembly to be the thing that it runs. So .NET, you know, public static void main, uh, hello world. And then, you know, as we're all, uh, people on Windows hardly ever do this, but as we're all, you know, real programmers, uh, we'll make it be an int and we'll return zero, you know? Um, because that's awesome. And then uh, .NET run. Actually, no, let's get it to return one. That'd be a bit more interesting. Uh, oh, no, let's get it to return 42. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Not quite sure what that error code is. Uh, oh, come on. Right, .NET run again. Might give us some this VM more memory. And then echo. I can't remember. It's dollar question mark, isn't it, to get it to return yeah. the Come on. Ba, 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 ba. There you go. Forty-two. So yeah. Woo there you go. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> I got a clap for that. <laughs> nice. You're a very generous audience. <laughs> okay. Uh, yo, blah blah blah. Namespaces. Public static main. HC style comments. And then it's worth thinking, there's, um, you've got visibility, so you've got public, you have private, um, and then you have a thing called, in, so private's within the, uh, cla within the namespace. No, within the, in the class. And then you have internal, which is within, within the namespace, and then protected, which is within the namespace or things that inherit from, or, I think. Uh, all, the, all the different ones are there. Generally, you... You tend to use mostly public and privates when you're doing most development and then protected and internal when you're thinking about APIs and stuff, but most code is, you know, fairly open. Um, and, yeah, so there you go. That's a, that's a C-sharp program. We're not, we're not, we're not hammer it. If you want to learn more, go click on the tutorial. Right. Let's flip through the basics. So, uh, you know, it's, just, it's exactly how you expect it to be. So you have uh, basic types. <coughs> X equals one. Uh, you can do stuff like you know x plus plus, so increment x, and then store the store the result in x. You can have uh, plus plus x as well. So give me x first, and then go increment it. <coughs> um, what else do we have? That's you know just stuff. Usual what you expect from a programming language, really. Uh, and obviously you have different scope. You can declare a variable within your method or you can declare a variable within the class. Um, if you declare a variable within some, within some uh, curly braces, then that's the scope of the variable, basically. Uh, 
in .NET, when you do like int or uh, uh, foo or <coughs> uh, string bar, they're actually just aliases to uh, system dot uh, string. I guess is it? Yeah, probably. And they're just aliases to the underlying system classes, so they're just there really as a as a convenience to make code easier to read. But um, uh, we always use the aliases for the common types: int, bool, string, uh, float, all that sort of thing. But it's important to remember C# -sharp is a, a type safe language. These are types underneath, and then you have nullable types, non-nullable types, and, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so int question mark would be a nullable int and things like that. Okay. Um, and then in uh, the way that inheritance is done in C sharp <coughs> is um, with a you know so it's object it's an object oriented language object oriented type safe language so the way inheritance is done is you declare a class say food you then declare your base class it's quite a nice you know short syntax you just do colon food rather than uh, I can't I can't remember what it is in Java it's been uh, gosh. I'm my job there, if I remember that. Anyway, yeah, uh, extend. What is it? Yeah, okay. And then um, what, what always makes me pause for thought is doing is how you do um, constructors in C sharp because you don't do uh, you don't do the constructor and then do this bracket the constructor. You you overwrite you call the base constructor from your other constructor. So it's again. It's a bit weird at first, but once you've got used to it, you get used to it. So here, in this example here, I've got broccoli and um, uh, broccoli and chocolate, are specialist types of the food class. And what I, I've got a method on food called uh, eat. Now in C sharp, you have to declare a method as virtual if you want it to be able to be overridden. Uh, you, it doesn't, you don't get that magically. Um, you have to say, yes, I intend this to be overridden by an, imp by an implementing class. And then, uh, so I've declared that as virtual. And then food, uh, chocolate doesn't override, so when you call eat, it goes nom nom. But then if you call eat on broccoli, it, it, it throws an invalid operation exception, because he wants to do that. Um, now, uh, in notice as well, in C sharp, uh, uh, exceptions of runtime exceptions, you, know, you throw them and then you have that, you can have specific try catch finally blocks, but um, you generally don't, you don't declare, you know, not in Lang in Java you have throws uh, invalid operation exception, you generally don't do that, it's runtime exceptions in C sharp. Okay, uh, make sure I've covered everything. Ryan, we've done, we've whipped through. We're doing great. Inheritance, polymorphism, uh, bags, blah, 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 let's go. And then blah, 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 operators. Oh, here's a neat thing in C-sharp. Um, so you can do... Yeah, we do that. Okay. Uh, I'll just show you this now, I remember. So say if you want to do... We've got hello, Bruno. Uh, we can have, you know, string name um, equals... No. And then, so, well, let's, let's do it the other way around. Let's do it the short way first. So we can do, hello, Bruno, like that. Then if we want to, we want to make a variable called Bruno that passes the name in, uh, equals Bruno. Now, C Sharp has, um, uses string formatters quite a lot. So by a string formatter, I mean, um, String dot format blah. You know, you, you have this in other languages where you pass like a format string in, and you can you can do some stuff. You can tell it you want it to be a decimal number or whatever, um, and it and it can do substitution for you. How we do that? In, um, we have that in C sharp, but we have some nice syntax for that. So I can say hello, and I want to substitute in something, and then I can pass my variable in. And then I can pass as many of these as I want. And each one of these is a positional indicator within that string. So the first one, the second one, well, the zeroth one, the first one, the second one, you know, because it's an array of objects you're passing in. So that works. Sorry, I've done that wrong. Um, control C. 
So that. Sorry. Wow, my keyboard doesn't seem to be typing. Mm, there we go. Um, so that, that works as a substitution of a variable, and that would execute. In C Sharp 6, here we go, C Sharp 6 feature, um, they introduced uh, a way of getting it to evaluate strings. So I could actually do dollar and then name here, and it actually, um, that should work. Oh, I probably have to declare my variable first. Well, in fact, why don't I just do dollar args, wow, I never tried, no, if this works, arg zero. Yeah, so I'm gonna pass in to my hello the first thing I'm going to pass into my command line. And I'm just going to come up here, dot net run, uh, let's do devconf instead. Uh, let's see if it goes horribly wrong. I appear to have forgotten how to type today. Wow, it's been really sad. Hey, look at that, magic. So that's, some, that's just some neat, and that's just syntactic sugar that they've added in C-sharp 6, but it's nice. Makes your code shorter and easier to read. Okay. Collections. Uh, you, have, uh, you have proper generics in C-sharp, so you can do, you know, a uh, list of string um, equals new list of type string and then you can actually go and uh, declare a bunch of strings now if you wanted to uh, yeah so I'm doing it I'm building a generic collection so that way now when I go to um, and then you have um, so you've got the usual uh, do while loops and all those standard loops you're used to there's a cool one as well for for each. So for each uh, word in, oops. Uh, so I can say for each word in list, and it's clever enough to know that list is now a string, the compiler is. So if I do uh, list dot index, index of a uh, because it knows that it knows that list is a string oh no sorry word what am I doing word index of a because it, it is saying uh, over the enumeration over the collection of lists over the enumeration of lists give me all the word give me every element of that collection and put it into a variable called word. Now, when I say var word, that's the same as me saying uh, string word. Both of those things would still compile, but I can't be bothered remembering what everything is, so I'm just going to type var in and let the compiler work out what the actual class, what the actual type is, and that's worked out at compile time. So it's not, you know, it's, that's not an example of dynamic, dynamic languages there, that's an um, or duck type, and that's the compiler turning it into a real type at, at compile time. Uh, and then, so that now gives me a variable called word for every item of the list, and then does that loop for every item of that list. So I, or I could just do word, I just do, yeah, let's just do this. Uh, um, console dot right line word. There you go. So. Okay, so while that's running, I'll uh, go and just check, make sure I've covered off all the stuff we wanted to cover. Blah, 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 control flow. And you can come back and if you want to get into more in depth, you can. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, and I've done, uh, again, if you want to do some of these while I'm in the room, feel free. But I've done little exercises to practice and stuff. So feel free to just go and do those if you, re if you want to learn a bit more. The, ne the thing that's... So, for each is nice. Okay, great. Apart from that, what else has C Sharp got for me? Okay. Uh, I quite like the way it does properties. So, you know in... Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, you know in... Sorry. Um, you know in, when, you're quite often, when you're building a, um, a plain old, you know, like a, 
a, a plain old class, a, a POCO or whatever, a plain old Java object or a, or a plain old C-sharp object. Um, you do the whole, you know, public class person, and then you do like private string first name, and then you do public string get name per, get person, which returns person, and then public set string set person, and then you know set. You do all that just stuff that you just have to do, and you use V sharp or use IntelliJ if you've got any sense to write that code for you, because it's just this always boilerplate code you don't want to write. Well, in C Sharp has some cool syntax to actually stop you from having to do that. So um, if I, I'm just going to jump in and show you this rather than, you don't need to see me type it. Uh, oh yeah, look, that worked. Did that work? I don't know. Yeah. Right, okay. If I go to... Um, properties. So I'll show you the person class because there's some neat stuff. So uh, what are this and this is the this is the answer to the fourth of the exercises. So there you go. You, you know, spoiler alert. But um, uh, if I'm defining a class called person, for when I'm defining my properties, I can just say public string and the name of the property, and then the fact that I want a getter and a setter. And it'll generate them for me. It'll generate the private, and it'll generate the get and set for me as well. So I don't need to do that. Equally, if I just wanted it to be a read-only property, so I just want to be able to, um, like, age, I want it to be read-only, I could just say get semicolon with no set, and it, it would have no corresponding setter method. And then the way that you call those properties in code is, you would say... Um, Person, person equals new person, as you do, you know, because you can actually speed that bit up a bit as well, but, uh, uh, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, control Z, control C, there we go. When I use my Mac, for non-Mac things, I use a proper keyboard rather than a Mac keyboard because my muscle memory makes me do Command C rather than Control C. So, uh, but I don't have my proper keyboard with me here. So there we go. So, um, so person person equals new person, and then I can do things like uh, person dot um, you know full name uh, person dot uh, first name, and that's. Uh, that's how you call that getter and setter. So you actually call them with a, you know, you don't have get, put get full name and things, you just call it as a property. Um, and then if you want to, if you try to do that on a method, say if you try to set a property where it wasn't allowed in your definition, then you'd actually get a compile time error still, you know. Right. Um, but what we've also shown an example of in this class here is, um, and what I'll do is I'll execute it. Well, it's done. Right. Oh, no, I need to do Control C. Right. What we also can do here is um, we, we're doing things like we're, we're calculating a property. So the, when you call a getter, it's actually doing, and this is, the, this is always one of the questions that they give you in interviews, you know, how do you calculate the age of someone? And if you know a trick, it's really easy. Dates and getting it wrong because it's um, you know what happens if you turn twenty one during a year or whatever. Anyway, so. uh, there, there's the age, and then um, so that's calculated property. You can you can cache properties if you want. So here we have an example of a of a user ID which is stored in private storage. When I get it, if one doesn't exist already, if it's null or white space, there's handy little methods for all that sort of stuff then it'll, it'll lazily generate one, it'll calculate one. So here it's calculating it to be, you know, 
Uh, M would would for you know seventy six or whatever, and then it's returning it. But if you've explicitly set it, then you can override the name. Um, so, but in this example with age, I'm not lazily, I'm not caching my value of age because age you want to always calculate because you might have got older. You know, you might have called the last time you called age might have been after the object was created or whatever. So, uh, you need to calculate that every time. And then similarly, uh, a proper a bool which identifies if you're an adult, it does that there. And then .NET run. And then just quickly, some other cool syntactic sugar that you have in C sharp. Um, that's how you. That, we showed you already. That's how you create a list of. That's how I'm creating a list and instantiating it with values with objects in in the same bit of syntax. You know, all that's quite easy to do. And it, it looks, when it's not so big, um, it looks neat. You know what I mean? It's quite a nice, nice, easy to read language. Okay. And there we go. So that's calculated all there. And then you've got Bob Microsurfed. And that's his user ID in his AOL style. So cool. Right. Property syntax is nice. That's one of the things I love. And then again, you've got a whole bunch of stuff here about uh, different things you can do with properties. Um, Right, here we go. Delegates and Lambda expressions. Right. I'm going to go through this because I want to... The syntax I want to get you to is... Let's show you... Here we go. Is this syntax here. So here I have a collection of numbers. And what I'm doing is I'm defining out, I'm evaluating if I is even or not. And then I'm using that to give me the number out of a um, collection. So I'm finding all of the elements of this collection which match that particular criteria. When I first... So I did... I, I was a Java guy. I was a VB guy originally. Then I did Java. Then I did C Sharp in like C Sharp 1, 1.1. And two, you know, two with generics was like, oh, that's new, because I'm from the Java world, we, we didn't really have proper generics yet, and I was never allowed to use Java 5 or whatever it came in anyway, so. Um, and then, um, so it was all a bit, oh, that's a bit advanced. And then I went back into Java world for 10 years, while working for Microsoft, I might add, for five of those years. So, uh, and then I came back to C Sharp, and I was, so everything after C Sharp 2 is all a bit new. And I open up some code, and I see, you know, I, I see that syntax. I'm like, oh, am I in C++ all of a sudden? What's going on here? You know, I don't, I don't understand it. So, it's actually quite easy. Uh, and if you already get this, then great. But it took me a while to figure it out. So basically, um, you have the ability in C Sharp to have delegates. So I can, I can say, I can define a method. So here we go public static reverse string and I can I can set my delegate type called reverse I can define it and point it at a method which implements that signature so there we go I've got reverse string which is implementing uh, you pass me a string I return you a string and I've got a thing called delegate where it's basically give me anything which implements give it a Give it a string, get back a string. So this is an interface. This is a del so I, this, you know, I can have anything which implemented that particular uh, method signature. So that's what a delegate is, and then you do it, and it reverses the string. Awesome. You can actually call it like you know, like a method, the delegate. And then there's a bunch of helper f functions to save you having to create you know generic like strongly typed delegates the whole time. They have a bunch of generic um, delegate helpers, uh, action, uh, function, and predicate. And basically, if we do like a, a, a function one there, this is a, a delegate that does something. So it takes a string. It, um, sorry, it takes a string. It returns a string, and then that's me defining it there as a delegate. And then you can also do that anonymously using this syntax here. So you can actually define, remember I was doing list and then did an open curly brace and actually 
defined my list as I was doing it. That's actually using an anonymous delegate. And I'm, at, I'm here, I'm, I'm sorry, not anonymous, anonymous task, but anyway. Here I'm coming in and I'm defining a delegate anonymously. And so I'm defining that. I'm saying, is a delegate, uh, pass in a number and then returns a number. All a lambda expression is, is this here with a bit of syntax. So all it's just syntactical sugar around defining anonymous inner delegates. So you say, I'm taking in I, and then I am doing something with it. I am, I'm, uh, this is an uh, evaluation. I'm going to return back to you uh, the, a Boolean because, find, because of what find all accepts. I'm going to return back to you a Boolean, which is the result of evaluating I divided by 2 equals, equals 0. Equals equals 0 is you know, the Boolean uh, test for equality in C-sharp, not, uh, not an assignment. So does I divided by 2 equals 0? If it does, then... Um, return it, then that's what you want to return back a value of for when you pass in i. And that is exactly the same, that gets compiled down into exactly the same piece of code as that. But it's a lot easier to read, it's, you know, short. So maybe not easy to read, but it's short. And you, you do get used to them. Um, and then you can do cool stuff with them. You can also do, as well as functional ones, you also have statement. Uh, lambdas, so I'm actually coming in here and I'm executing two commands as part of my delegate so I'm doing uh, I'm passing in a string and I'm going to format the string with hello something and I'm going to write it out so now when I call my delegate passing in Alice, it says hello Alice so it's pretty cool and it's a great way of uh, confusing your friends and writing some very terse syntax methods and things and passing around but it's also really handy with APIs because you can not start to build a bunch of APIs now where you don't need callback handlers and you don't need to register for event handlers. You just pass in the code which does it, which makes it significantly easier to read when you're calling an API that needs a callback. And in, in the Windows world, there are lots of APIs that need callbacks because it's a UI paradigm, you know. But also there are lots of APIs that need callbacks because um, we have a lot of asynchronous programming in uh, server-side C-sharp as well. Right. Next neat thing, uh, link, language integrated query. Again, when I saw this, when I came back to C-sharp world, I was like, what the what? Because uh, what you do is you look at your code and it's like somebody wrote some SQL backwards in your C-sharp program. Notice the select clause is at the end. So but it's select new link expert from programmers where programmers dot is new to link is set to, is, is set to one. Huh, that's interesting. Oh no, actually, yeah, there you go. I'm turning you into a link expert. That's good. So, um, but select, the reason why it selects at the end is because the compiler, and to do auto completing things, needs to know what P is before it can give you auto complete on the select part. So that's why, that's why they kind of reverse it. So apart from that, it's fine. That is just syntactical sugar over, this, over the API syntax which actually I find a lot easier to use myself, personally, uh, because it looks like actual code. Um, so where P is new to link, and then that's the same, that's what, that's what this gets converted into, these method calls. These method calls, when you, these get, there's a feature in C-sharp uh, extension method, so you can add methods to things, to other classes. And when you call the system, when you add system.link into your uh, class, then onto anything which implements I enumerable, it adds these link methods, like where and select and order by and things. Yeah? What is the type of the uh, link express variable? What's the type of what, sorry? What is the type of the variable? Uh, integer with list of... Oh, uh, in that case, yeah, it's always a good, yeah, it's always hard to work out, isn't it? Link experts would be what's evaluated. So it would be a, um, a new link expert where, yeah, from, it'd be a new link expert class. So, um, yeah, is what it would be. 
Link Expert's correct. It's a list of Link Expert. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. And then, yeah, there we go. Um, uh, bu 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 what does it say? And you can use um, Lambda expressions. One thing, the reasons why it's quite handy as well is you can use link syntax over anything which implements the IE viewable interface. So an array or whatever, or you know, a list, a collection. But also APIs can return objects which are complicated and do lots of crazy stuff, but also implement IE numerable. So they can optimize when they make server calls and network cache and all sorts of things. But you can write the same bit of code which just does data retype operations over some data, regardless of if it's a, a database or a, you know, a, um, a JSON API or, a, or, a, or just a collection in memory. Um, da, 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 da. And then we have an example of here. This is what's in the. This is the example that's in the tutorial in the exercises. But basically, the the one time I will use um, the query syntax is when I'm using the let keyword, and that actually it's easier to read it in query syntax. Is what you what the intention of the code is. But I'm saying from my sentence in from from my collection of strings. Um, give me a sentence. So yeah, from strings, and then split sentence down into words. So give me a thing called sentence, which is from my strings. Split it into words. Now you know you're doing some hacking when you dust off split. That's like string tokenizer in Java. You know you're hacking when you dust that class off. It's great fun. So anyway, string dot split on space. Give me a words, and then from that collection of words, give me a word. And set so W to be word to be a lowercase word, and then give me everything where the first character of the word is a vowel, and then return. So that actually you can read what that's doing fairly well, but the converting that into API syntax gets quite hard because of all the inner stuff and anonymous inner delegates that come in, and yeah, it's just horrible. But you can do it. Um, now, as you can tell, it's very easy to very quickly write some, some, a lot of code here because it's a, you know, you're writing a lot of stuff by doing this. And depending on the API you're calling, it can perform terribly as well. So you, know, you have to be careful about what you're actually doing, but you can do it. Um, and it's very easy to read and very terse. Okay. Uh, blah blah blah, and then in the exercise, oh, it's got some other. It's got all the types of stuff you kind of do with data, you know, like unions and joins and uh, order buys and all that sort of stuff. You can do all that stuff, which actually becomes really handy when you get you've got a collection of things and you just want to reverse it. You can just do an order by on it, um, you know, order by descending or whatever. It, it actually is a really nice way of working with collections of stuff, regardless of where they've come from. And then, I don't, we're not, we don't cover it in the exercise, in the tutorial, but there's a thing called plink. So if you do, or clink, if you do as parallel um, as part of the core, so here, it'll actually uh, split off um, the, the methods. You know, it'll actually parallelize the invocation of this as much as it can um, and pull back the results and try, and try and do it in parallel execution. Um, the, it's great for um, doing st stuff where you want to parallelize where um, the, the, what you're doing has no side effects on pulling data together. But if you actually want to do it and go affect things in parallel, then there is a parallel task library it's called that you can use, which actually helps you do that. But um, it's kind of built into the language if you just want to go pull data together because you can do that safely quite easily. Okay. Right. Asynchronous programming, and then we're nearly there. So again, this was the number, This was the other new thing, which a lot, a lot of the APIs now in .NET are async APIs. So uh, asynchronous APIs, because asynchronicity is good if you want to return back to the UI thread, but also in the server, you know, the more asynchronous you are, the more scalable your solution is. You're not tying up a thread with uh, handling your request. Um, uh, when you use the asynchronous keyword, it, the, the framework manages all your thread pooling and um, uh, uh, 
thread you know, allocation for you and a thread state for you. And so um, if you're in a bit and it's not doing anything, it goes down into the operating system and signals an interrupt, um, tell it to come back when it's ready, and then it carries on execution inside of its application and does some stuff. And then when the operating system comes back and says, yeah, I'm ready, then it goes to there and re-invokes things. So it's a way of doing great um, parallelization. But in terms of like a, a and really low level down at the OS, you know, doing interrupt-based parallelization, but actually in the language, it's really straightforward to use. So I'll give you the, the example I'll show you. Here's an example of doing it. Um, you know, so this is really useful if you're doing any I/O operate, any any significant I/O operation. Which mostly, when we're writing cloud applications, every I/O operation is a significant I/O operation because you know your disk might just disappear or whatever. So you know it, you tend to use this a lot nowadays. Um, so here we have an example where I'm I'm calling HTTP client and I'm running a task. So I'll show you the, this syntax here. So I'm doing await HTTP client, get string asynchronously, and uh, return back the, uh, the, the, the contents of that web page as a string. And then I'm doing a match on HTML, how many times it finds the word .NET in the .NET Foundation web page using period .NET rather than .NET. You know, happens quite a lot. Um, so yeah. And then if you want to do, that's an example of the console application version of it, where I'm actually, um, where I'm a static rather than an await. Now, the way that the, um, one thing I want to just make sure I want to show you. I'll show you the exercise, actually, because I think that demonstrates it better. Um, so if I go into, I, I give you some sample code here, but let's just bring it up. And then that's probably enough. And I could show you ASP. So, um, oh, sorry. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Oh, I'm in the wrong operating system. There we go. Uh, okay, CD, CD. Uh, sorry about this. Okay, fine. Um, It's really slow. Oh, well, I'll show you in the, the sample code. Basically, what I'm doing here is I've got some sample code, one that does a slow operation and one that does a fast operation. And then I'm going to try, and uh, here we go. So, it's just being really slow for me now for some reason. Um, yeah, I'm going to try and call the, met the slow operation asynchronously. Bring up the code when you see it. You call the slow operation first, and then you call the fast operation, and then you see that the fast operation is dumping out to the console while the slow operation is in a sleep state. And then the slow operation, and then the fast operation finishes first. The slow operation finishes, and then the program halts to execution at the point where you're waiting for the result of the slow operation. If I could just show you the code. I know where I'll show you the code. Let's just show you on GitHub. There you go. So exercise three. Uh, so here's my, here's my do something class where I'm saying it's an asynchronous operation. I've got a, a delay, so I'm waiting 100. And then in my for loop, I'm just dumping out to the console. And then what I do here in my program class is I say, run my slow task. And you actually see it kicking off the slow task. It gets to a point where it sees that it's waiting for something, uh, whatever type of operation it's waiting for. It then does carries and then returns operation back into your fast class, runs it, and then you get the um, slow task, then the fast task. Sorry, you see the fast task running, 
Well, then it, it holds here because you're saying you want the re you're saying I would like the result of slow task now, please. And then that point is where it actually halts the execution of the program because you're waiting for it. So, and then it'll carry on going. But all that magic of thread thingy in the Maryland state and blah 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 is just all taken care of for you with that really really cool syntax. And then the final thing I'll show you just quickly as we head out the door, it, I'll just do it in here as I'm in here, is the way that ASP.NET works. So if I do, uh, now I'm going to jump back to the old, so rather than doing this .NET command, which is actually fairly new, I'm going to do, um, uh, an, I'm gonna do a new, new type of syntax, but I'm just going to generate my ASP.NET site first of all. So yo ASP.NET, using Yeoman to just quickly generate a template one. Uh, what kind of ASP.NET application do you want? I want a simple... Uh, I want a big web application with login and everything, you know, as if I'm going to build a, a website for, this, for the conference. Uh, what's the name of it? Uh, dev, conf, and then it's done it there. And then if I just do cd dev conf uh, code, open it up. And while that's doing its stuff, thank you. <laughs> while that's doing its stuff, put that there. Uh, DNU, restore. I'm just doing this in here as well because I didn't because my VM seems to have started hanging. Um, so this is an ASP.NET site, and again, in the tutorial, I kind of, exp uh, well, actually don't, I will explain more about it, but I've, I've got one to go up, which explains more. But you come in, and uh, you've got the controller code, but also you've got, say, the, um, the view. This is a model view controller style application. So uh, let's do the uh, layout. Anyway, and then you, to, to run it, you just do uh, DNX web. But a web application in the new world is basically just the console application still. If I go to Startup CS, you'll actually see uh, there is the public static void main class where it's kicking off a web application and running it. So there's a web server called Kestrel, and it's just a main method. Yes, sir. Uh, so the question was portability, and um, you can create libraries which you can take between the two called a portable class, uh, not portable class, sorry, you can create a NuGet package that has all the different framework versions in it, and then um, so you can build, you know, framework, full framework and .NET Core at the same time, and that, that, that works. And then in terms of ASP.NET applications, you can build an ASP.NET Core application and have it run under IIS on top of .NET full framework as well as running in .NET Core world. So can I take existing application which is working with .NET framework and just put this to uh, .NET Core uh, and run it? No, is the short answer. So can you, uh, um, usually, so .NET Core is, uh, uh, we've made a much more modular library. So we're in Q&A time now, by the way. So we'll keep, I mean, we've, got, we've got one more minute. So I need to rebuild it. You need to rebuild it, and it's probably going to be, thank you, it's probably going to be some refactoring of it as well. Because um, the, the library is ASP.NET, .NET Core is a more modular version of .NET. So it used to be when you installed .NET in a box, it came with everything. You know, all the threading, everything, and like system.drawing, which is, you know, used to draw to the UI. <laughs> everything, it was there. And people would use everything. Um, now with .NET Core, it's much more modular, so you have to... Uh, you have to use the modules and then use that opportunity to break actually parts of .NET down into more modules. So some things have moved a little bit. There's a tool called API Core on GitHub, API tool, which will analyze your application for you and tell you which APIs you so might need to change. Maybe, maybe let's have the question, what is compatible? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, are there APIs compatible? The APIs are the APIs, oh, yeah, the most of the APIs are there. But there are things have moved. So some things have moved. Things like threading have moved. Um, the way that it handles application domains has completely changed. Um, so those sorts of areas. But if you're just doing standard stuff and all like system.link, all that stuff we're doing today is exactly the same. They both stay the same, and it just you just recompile it. But when it comes to doing something more, about 90. You normally, when you run the analyzer of your application, you find about 95, 90 percent of your applications 
work, you know, it's, it's got to work, and it shows you which bits aren't, and you can go look at those, and it gives you suggestions of where to fix them. Um, the worst thing is always your dependencies, because you never build an application greenfield. You, you've got to have a library, have a .NET Core version. And so one of my jobs, and I'm out of time, is to go and um, actually work with all the different open source library vendors and get them to, uh, and, or, or open source projects, and help them have a core version as well. Thank you. And then, and any more questions? I'll be outside. Yeah, so thank you. Just remind you, you can vote for lightning calls in front of D105. And if anyone's got any follow up, I'm going to be here till, I'm actually here till Monday morning, but I'm here all day today and all day tomorrow. So come grab me. We'll have some beers tonight as well. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you. incredibly performant, so if you can use .NET Core, then use it, because it's a mix of performance. Um, so yeah. No worries. And also developing the whole of the hearts. Yeah, no, uh, I would not, not for .NET Core yet. Yeah. To do that, you have to use Mono for that still. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, that's pretty, yeah, that's good to know. And, uh, and also things like the async APIs and stuff, they really help building UI applications because you don't want to tie up the UI thread and all that stuff. So. Cool. Thanks for coming. Thank you. I'll get out of your way. Sorry, sir. Here you go. Popíseš, čo by mali mať nastavené? A keby niečo, ja to mám, by som si spustil svoj server, aby si to stiahli. Jo, dobře, není to distribuované, akorát, ale nejak vás počká. Mali by to tam tiež byť, ale tam je to ako predávať do virtuálky, a to sú také základné veci, ako v Java, keď je to vyprávanie Java. Ale zastavovanie tady, ako by to bylo problém zastavovanie? Jo, tam väčšinou je to má asi 8 mikrobajtov. A potom to je ráno, ako mi vyjednutá. Mm. 
Můžeme poprosit? Můžu mám ještě něco tuto nastavit, aby to sami to, to dal Miro Romano? Takže on vám to tady kolega přepne potom. Aha, to, to ještě tuto někdy se třeba. Já bych to nechcel vyzkoušet, aby jsem to potom nemusel. Tak, tak, tak notebook asi teda. Ano. Výborně. budete vy ukazovať. Vy budete ukazovať priamo ako, ako je poňať ten workshop. To bude ako featurey v Eclipse, alebo ano. ako pracuje debugging? Tam je nejaký nie. protokol? A, a nie, tak. nie, nie. A hlavne pomocou Eclipse to budem ukazovať, ako môže si človek zastaviť kód, kedy potrebuje, či podmienené breakpointy, na rôzne exceptions to môže nastaviť. Prípadne, ako čo si môže zobraziť, aké premenné. Typicky veľakrát má človek zastavený kód, a teraz, sakra, ja by som potreboval ešte toto si pozrieť toto, tak vlastne ako si spustí nejaký vlastný Java kód, aby si mohol vylistovať, čo potrebuje. A čo sa týka, potom je tam ešte, pod, že môže človek skákať, opakovať si jednotlivé metódy, môže skákať medzi, vlastne aký Java stack trace, vlastne medzi tými metódami môže človek skákať a spúšťať 